Hello and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I am Sarah Ann Minkin, Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Foundation. Today is June 4th, 2024, and I'm delighted to be here with Khaled El Gindi and Lara Friedman. Khaled is a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute, where he also directs MEI's program on Palestine and Israeli Palestinian affairs. Lara is president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. MEI and FMEP have just partnered on a congressional teach in series, the fourth time we've done this very special series of private briefings for congressional staff. The briefings were truly excellent, and we want to share them with you, our audience. So today we're releasing them to the public. I wanted to speak with Lara and Khaled together so they can introduce us to the series. So let's start with this. What is the Congressional Teach-In Series? Khaled, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay, so, so, the, uh, so the idea, I think Lara and I had a similar idea at the same time in 2021. Um, the idea was, you know, Congress is a, obviously a key player in this in this issue. Um, probably disproportionate uh, focus on Israel Palestine issues in relation to other foreign policy issues, and the vast majority of it is in the negative uh, column. I would say, and and so we wanted to try to inform congressional staffers and to expose them to different uh, perspectives that they probably aren't hearing uh, on the Hill in your standard uh, hearings that, that happen in the House and Senate in relation to Israel and Palestine. And so we wanted to expose them to all kinds of uh, different perspectives that they wouldn't otherwise um, have access to. And so we thought, let's do this private briefing series um, on a whole range of topics related to Israel-Palestine from, you know, the traditional uh, final status issues like settlements in Jerusalem and refugees to international law and um, how that figures into, into the equation um, or Gaza or kind of other more uh, specific issues. And so, so that was the, the thinking behind uh, putting together this series four years ago, or I guess three years ago for the first time in, in 2021. Right. And this year it's the fourth. Laura, is there anything you want to add about the, the nature of the Congressional Teach-In Series or um, why it is valuable to, to hold a private briefing series with congressional staffers? Yeah, I mean, very much what, what Khaled was saying, the idea here was to, to expose staffers, um, and this is obviously an opt-in, it's staffers who have an interest, so they show up because they have an interest, um, expose them to, to information, expose them to viewpoints, help them, you know, start to build a their own Rolodex of voices that maybe they find interesting and want to hear again. Um, and, you know, the this year was a little different, we'll get into that on why this year was different, but in past years, we really did set this up in an almost... Um, academic way is almost a course, right? So the idea is that if you attended any one of these as a one-off, you learned a lot. If you attended all of them, there's an arc of learning that goes across all of the various uh, sessions. And it's it's not just like a, you know, Israel-Palestine 101. It goes a lot deeper than that. Um, but it's an, it's an opportunity to both learn the ABCs and also go much, much deeper into these issues that are very much on the agenda all of the time. For congressional offices, including congressional offices that maybe you wouldn't think this would be a big deal for them. Maybe the member is not on a key committee or is not focused on this. But, you know, almost every office, they have constituents who are interested in this. They, they're responding to letters and questions or, you know, they're they're having to vote on things related to this. Um, this is very much meant to be an opportunity to to for people to learn if they chose to do so. Great. Thank you for that explanation. And we will put links to the past year's congressional teach-in series, the congressional briefing series, uh, on, on the landing page for this year's, um, because as you just described, the last year's were really basically like a curriculum in Israel-Palestine 101 for congressional staffers. But this year was different. Um, this year, you decided to focus the, the series on Gaza. You entitled the series, The Gaza Catastrophe. 
Can you talk about what role Congress has at this exact moment with Gaza and what you were hoping congressional staff would take from this conversation about Gaza? Laura, let's start with you. Sure. And and actually, before we do, I want to just take something I should have mentioned in the last question, which is, you know, a lot of people do events for the Hill and they do them as public events, either online or actually in person on the Hill. And, you know, we started this during COVID when online made sense just in terms of people have it being accessible to people. But from the start, we chose to do this as a closed forum. Um, as in, you know, we're releasing them after the fact, but in real time, these are available only for Hill staff and for members of Congress if they choose to show up. And the idea there was to create a, well, I don't say a safe place, but in some ways a safe place where, you know, you're not worried about, you know, well, do you have to respond if you hear something that makes you uncomfortable or are you a concern that someone will see you showing up or do you have to ask a question or if you want to ask a question are people going to ask you why you're asking a question? It was intended to really be a place where people can learn without um, having to worry about it being a public space. And I think that is one of the things that enabled these um, in this year and in past years really to be successful is having that space to just take in information and, and maybe you'd agree with it, maybe you don't, but it's it's just an opportunity to listen. Um, in, in terms of this year, look, I mean, we, we've we been talking about this session really since last fall and what it would look like and it, it, it came together over time. The bottom line is it made no sense this year to do a, a you know, um, Israel-Palestine, you know, 101, 201, whatever um, series. This is, there's such immediate issues on the agenda. And, and and let's be honest, you know, Gaza was off the, the radar for a lot of people. We covered Gaza in our previous sessions. It was part of our curriculum. But I think for a lot of people, including people who are relatively educated on the Hill about Israel-Palestine, Gaza has been sort of an afterthought, except for when it bubbled up and Israel would go in and, quote unquote, mow the lawn and there'd be horrible images and horrible news. But the bottom line is that would last for a few weeks and then, you know, situation normal goes back. Um, and it it felt really like, you know, even if we hadn't already planned to do this series, that we we really had to do it this year um, to expose people to, you know, some baseline understanding of, of, you know, October 7th is not the beginning of time, right? Understanding that, understanding the dynamics pre-October 7th, post-October 7th, understanding the, the key things that are in play on the Hill having to do with who's, you know, what does accountability look like? international law, U.S. Congress, things that are being discussed. Um, there, there's a whole array of issues that when, you know, in the context of a larger discussion about Israel, Palestine, West Bank, East Jerusalem, maybe there's already more familiarity. With Gaza, there was a such a dearth of familiarity. Um, we felt it was just imperative to focus on this and to bring to to the fore voices that are expert on this, who, who maybe people um, hadn't listened to before and clearly should have been. Thank you for all of that, both for reminding us of the stakes of conversations around Israel-Palestine and why it was so important to be able to have private briefings, and specifically for what it means for people to actually engage with Gaza. Khaled, did you want to add anything? Um, not really. I mean, uh, I think Lara covered it. Great. Well, can I ask you to preview for us the different sessions? So the there were four sessions specifically focused on Gaza, the Gaza catastrophe. Um, so I want to ask you to tell us about the sessions, what they focus on. And also, just as you're telling us about them, they were recorded over the last three months. Uh, we know that they continue to be relevant and important, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about, about why, about how you framed them such that they would continue to be so important. Yeah, sure. So... Um... So we wanted this series to be focused, uh, focused uh, obviously on the issues related to Gaza and particularly, you know, since October 7th, um, but also uh, focused in that we we wanted to have a, a fewer number of sessions than we've had in the past. In the past, we've had upwards, we've had like six or eight different um, episodes in, in the series. And so this time we we felt given the urgency, we really wanted to to pack as much in as we could in in a very short, uh, relatively short period of time. So we we did it in four sessions, and the first session is what exactly what you'd expect. 
how did we get here? As Laura said, the world did not begin on October 7th. Um, there is a there's history, there's context, um, there's there's a lot of cause and effect that that needed to be covered. And so we wanted to have that that conversation. And instead of our usual three panelists, we we opted for two, uh, an Israeli perspective uh, and a perspective from Gaza. And again, because we wanted we wanted we really wanted to be as focused uh, uh, as we could in in the second session. Um, we, we looked at the question of the US role. And, and that's very much also connected to the question of how we got here. Um, uh, but, but the US being so prominent throughout the events since October 7th, the US is being the primary uh, sponsor of Israel militarily, first and foremost. Um, the US has supported Israel's war aims uh, and war um, execution at virtually every stage. Uh, and so that needed to be uh, addressed in, in, in some detail. Um, in the third part, we, we took a wider lens uh, looking at the, the, the questions about international law and the humanitarian situation. Um, the, the, the crisis has produced pretty significant interventions um, at the international level by both the International Court of Justice, uh, the South African genocide case that has been, um, that is going to be adjudicated over the coming years, um, but also now also the, the International uh, Criminal Court, which is uh, likely to be issuing arrest warrants for both Israeli and Hamas leaders uh, in the coming uh, weeks or months. So, um, Obviously, there's a lot going on there that will have very long-term implications, and that needs explanation and un unpacking. And then there's the question that is on most people's minds of, okay, even if you can get a ceasefire deal, what, what happens next, um, specifically in relation to internal Palestinian politics? Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about the day after, uh, but... Um, very little of that discussion um, involves actual Palestinians talking about what their future is like, both in Gaza and in relation to Gaza and the West Bank and the broader Palestinian national uh, movement, because there is a sense among Palestinians that this is a singular moment um, on par with 1948 and 1967 and maybe even bigger than either of those. And so that's that's sort of the the overarching uh, logic behind each session. Thank you. That's great. Will you tell us something about the the experts you invited to to address this audience? Me or I think Laura, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, we we try to bring in a diversity of voices, including voices that we haven't featured before. Um, there were several there were several people on these panels that I had never actually interviewed before and, and learned a tremendous amount. Um, you know, on the first panel, Muhammad Abu Sadeh from Al Azhar University of Gaza was just extraordinary. Um, again, this arc of learning about you know really Gaza before October seventh and 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 connecting to to current uh, developments I think was just extraordinary. We have Miram Zonshine who's from the International Crisis Group who's just um, so, so prolifically brilliant. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of interest in our second session because we had Josh Paul, who was one of the officials, and he was the first official who had resigned um, from the State Department, uh, who was talking about things from the perspective of someone who'd been involved in, in, in weapons transfers for many, many years from the inside, uh, who'd come out publicly talking about it. Um, I would say, you know, in the third session, there was a tremendous amount of interest because we talked, we, we had Raz Siegel, who is, I think, one of the first um, academics, he's an Israeli expert on genocide, who'd come up very early on talking about why genocide is the proper term to be using um, when discussing what's happening in Gaza. And, and we had Raz with a, a brilliant woman named Shireen Tadros, who's from Amnesty International, and Chris Gunnis, who's formerly of, of UNRWA. Um, I mean, the three of them together, I think, painted an incredibly powerful picture, both of what international law is supposed to do and where it is failing 
and what accountability would look like and require. I will say for me, the most the most intellectually sort of painful and challenging episode was the final episode um, where we had, I mean, we had three Palestinian brilliant um, experts, uh, Al-Hadi um, Al-Ijil, is that how you say his name? Al-Ijil, um, Nur Oday and Muin Rabani, um, looking at various aspects of the way forward. And, and listening to them, it's just, it's so striking how much of what they're talking about, which is really, you know, the core of, you know, it's one thing to say we need ceasefire, we need humanitarian aid. But when people talk about a day after, um, everything they're talking about is critical and it's completely absent from the public discourse. It's completely absent from what we see, when, whether it's politicians or, or, you know, commentators in mainstream media. Um, it was striking to me how much distance needs to be bridged between what are not, you know, powerfully ideological or or fanciful dreams of a future. These are bridging between here is a reality that must be contended with, and here's where we are on the ground. And and the distance um, seems almost um, unbridgeable. Listening, to, l looking at what they're saying, and listening to what the public discourse is saying today. Thank you for that preview, both of you. So today we're releasing the series to a broad public. What do you want our audience to take away from this series? Well, I think I think what we want the audience to, to take away isn't all that different than what we wanted congressional staffers to take away. And that is, here are a set of uh, subject matter experts and perspectives that uh, maybe as students or as journalists or as, you know, people in the think tank world um, or just as, as ordinary people who are curious about this, you know, huge uh, and horrific event that's happening in the world to, to give them uh, the resources um, of people who are directly connected to, to events on the ground, um, perspectives that they might not otherwise uh, be exposed to. And, uh, you know, we, we live in an age where people don't necessarily rely on the mainstream media and traditional sources of information any longer. And there are upsides and downsides to that reality. But uh, one of the upsides is, is that there's a, a kind of uh, democratization of, of information. And people have access, they can get information directly from sources on the ground or who are um, you know first responders in a lot of ways to to events on the ground so um so the idea was was to bring these uh resources to uh, to the general public um and and I will say I think as a as a series this year and as a series of series, uh, it's an incredibly useful educational tool for educators because I know for a fact, as the parent of you know high school students, I know these conversations are happening at every level, um, high school, middle school, certainly at universities. And so this is an incredibly useful educational tool for educators at all levels. And so we really want to make that available to to them. Thank you. Uh, I would just add also, I I hope that what we're doing here, and I know with in, in past years, we know some of the these series have been used by educators, which is just incredibly gratifying. I hope we're modeling a little bit what it looks like to engage experts in a way that is is genuinely seeking information, right? When you know Khaled and I spend a tremendous amount of time on the the question scripts trying to trying to figure out you know what is what are we trying to get answers for and we don't write questions based on here is what we want you to say we're not we, we don't write questions to elicit a specific answer we're trying to elicit information and understanding um and like i said i will you know for me some sometimes these are incredibly challenging conversations, challenging to not become despondent, right? Or challenging not to say, well, what about? Or, you know, it, 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 there's so much to cover here. And if you if you make yourself stop and really listen, that's that's where learning starts. And I think that's something we are really trying to model here. 
Wonderful. Both of you. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. I hope that this is helpful for our audience. People ask me all the time for 101s and where to start. And the answer is that there isn't just one 101. There isn't just one place to start. There are so many on-ramps there and we need more and more. And what you're describing is creating an on-ramp for understanding not just what's going on in Gaza right now, but what's going on in Gaza and why it matters to the U.S. Congress because of the U.S. role right now and and really how to approach these issues. Laura. And just to add one more thing, and this is a shout out to the amazing support we got from our colleagues in the back office. That includes you, Sarah Ann. Um, so folks understand that when this is posted, what will be posted with each episode is a collection of resources. Um, and we've worked with the speakers. We've invited them to share resources that they have written um, that they think are valuable, and we've collected our own. The idea is really to create a, a center where people can come, and if they found something interesting, they can dig deeper. So I hope people will use that as well. And we welcome anyone in our audience to tell us how you're using these materials. We love hearing from you. We hear from professors regularly about people who use our, our webinars and our podcasts in their classes and our lists of resources for part of their curriculum. So Lara, Khaled, thank you for everything you did, for everything you do. Thank you specifically for sharing your time today. And I wanna also thank our audience for turning into this, tuning in to this episode of Occupied Thoughts. Please listen to the entire series, um, this congressional briefing, this fourth congressional briefing series. And please make sure to check out our website, the FMEP website, www.fmep.org for resources related to this podcast, to lots of other great content related to Palestine and to Israel. You can make sure that you're subscribed to this podcast to stay up to date. We're on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. And you can also watch video versions of our podcasts, including this one on YouTube. And with that, I am Sarah Ann Minkin, signing off until the next episode of Occupied Thoughts. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Khaled. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.